Hi, I'm Jeff Butler, and this is Morgan London. We're both lawyers at Butler Law Firm. We want to talk today briefly about a, a case uh, that Morgan and I recently settled for about $3.97 million. It was a voting case that took place on Lake Lanier. Um, at Lake Lanier, you know, it can be a great time. You have a beach party, rent a boat. But sometimes things don't go well. Um, and you knew, since we're personal injury lawyers telling the story, that no one would have hired us if it went well, and it, and it didn't go well. There was an accident out there. And this was not the accident. We just thought this picture looked kind of funny. Uh, but the accident did involve a boat a lot like this. And Morgan can tell you a little bit about how it happened. Yeah, so uh, our client and a group of her friends uh, on Labor Day uh, weekend 2019, about two years ago now, uh, decided to go rent a boat uh, from this company. Um, and it's actually this exact boat with this slide down the back. It's a, a pontoon style boat, pontoon style party boat. Um, and that is important because uh, there were alcoholic beverages and uh, perhaps other substances, substances that were consumed um, on this boat uh, prior to the accident. So uh, our client and her friends decided to go out. They're out on the lake. It's about seven, eight o'clock at night, um, and uh, she decides to go down the slide. And as, after she goes down the slide, uh, the driver of the boat backs up over her uh, and, and ends up cutting her leg, which uh, ultimately had to be amputated, and, and Jed will tell you more about that. Um, but uh, uh, unfortunately, the driver at the time was intoxicated and uh, potentially under the influence of other substances. He was then subsequently arrested for boating while intoxicated, um, and, and those charges, I believe, are still pending against him. Um, so our client was taken to the hospital and unfortunately lost her leg. And I think Jazz is going to explain a little more about those damages. Yeah, um, you know, when you get backed over by a, for the propeller of an outboard motor, it's a bad thing. So we'll look through, I just want to show an x-ray. This is a, um, the offer that we put together to uh, two of the three insurance companies to settle a case. At the time we sent this, we only knew of two. We found out about a third after we sent the letter and had to later add that insurer. Um, these are pictures of our client. She was a very active person. She likes, there's a, she was on Stone Mountain riding horses. Uh, she liked to be in the water. She liked to work out. She was a young woman. She would go out you know, on the town like other folks do and like I used to do. Um, but of course, that changes um, after an accident like this. This is our, whoop, this is a copy of the docket showing that the at fault driver, the, the person who backed up over our client was uh, under the influence of alcohol and uh, was also charged with being high. Um, Here's our client again. These are some post amputation pictures. But what I really want to show you is here, um, and this is the X-ray of her leg after the after the accident. Um, it looks like exactly what happened. You can tell exactly where the propeller hit her and what it did to the bones in her leg or tibia, amphibia. So it was a really serious case, and we had a um, a really wonderful client who whose life had been affected in some severe ways, but who stayed positive and was, was really a pleasure to work for. Um, so in order to start working on the case, we did, did a pretty thorough investigation of the case. We, it actually came to us after another lawyer had been involved. That's one reason that it took so long from day of the accident to the day of the settlement, because our client didn't hire us first. It's the one thing she did wrong, but she had hired another firm who, you know, did something. They worked on the case for about a year and a half, but ended up they, they couldn't find a way to recover uh, or to collect compensation for her. So after about a year and a half of not really moving the ball, they dropped um, our client as a client, and then she went on the internet and she found us. So we got to work on the case that is usually that usually involves finding witnesses and talking with them. And Morgan can tell us about that. Yeah. So we ended up getting affidavits from two witnesses. Um, What's an affidavit? Uh, an affidavit is basically just a sworn statement. It is written testimony and uh, sworn to, uh, so that uh, the witness doesn't have to be deposed or 
um, really be bothered other than uh, giving the pertinent information that's in the affidavit. Um, so we, we got together uh, with two witnesses, uh, the first of which was someone who was, oh, gotcha. this, all right. Um, so was someone who was actually on top of the boat with uh, our client uh, before she went down the slide. Um, and so they were, they were pretty much together in the few minutes before and a few minutes after the accident. So uh, our, our witness here basically says and explains that there was a reason that they thought it was safe to go down uh, the slide. The reason is, is that they didn't think the engine was on. And there was a humming sound, and I think we, we went over the fact that they were on a party-style pontoon boat. And that party-style pontoon boat had a generator on it, which ran a fridge, a water pump, and a number of things. Um, so uh, there, there's a fridge in here, uh, there's a water pump, there's lights, uh, there's lots of things that, that need extra power in addition to just the motor back here. So in addition to a motor, there is an onboard generator. And uh, earlier in the day, they get into the, the water and they hear this humming sound. And they decide, well, you know, it's not safe if the engine is on and we're in the water. So they ask, and they, they were told at least twice earlier in the day that uh, the humming sound is actually coming from the onboard generator and not from the engine. So at any time the slide was on, the onboard genera generator needed to be on too. And the reason is that the onboard generator operated a pump that took water from the lake and pumped it up to the top of the slide and made the slide wet so you could go down. So anytime you go down the slide, the generator would be running. Yeah. So you're always hearing this constant humming sound um, when when that boat's in, in operation, whether or not the engine is on or the generator is being used. Um, so we we get this nice paragraph from the witness who basically explains that to us. And, uh, and then explains a little further about what her and our client did. So uh, they, they get to the top deck. Uh, as you can see, the slide is up here on the top deck. And they say that they believe that the, gen the uh, engine was off when they got to the top deck. And again, they say, we thought the humming sound was coming from the generator. And it's because two times earlier in the day, they had heard or had been told that the humming was coming from the generator. And because they believed the engine was off, they decided it was safe to go down the slide. And here our witness says pretty affirmatively she would not have gone down the slide if she knew that the engine was on. And the reason is, and, and this is not included in the affidavit, Don't worry. but uh, uh, she, she feels as though she could have been our client. Um, things, things are one, one second words, different. could have gotten her. Yeah. Her that got back to her. Exactly, exactly. And so she, she feels like, you know, I, I thought I made a safe decision and I, I'm pretty sure my friend also made a safe decision. And here is, is probably the most important paragraph in the affidavit. Um, the boat was not moving when uh, the client and I went down the slide. And the reason that this is important is because if the boat is not moving, the propeller is not moving. Um, and it's not being driven forward or backwards. So if the propeller is not moving, there's no chance that you know, you're, you're going to be struck by a moving propeller. So paragraph nine was, was probably the most important paragraph uh, of everything, but uh, with everything put together, um, you know, this helps prove that our client did nothing wrong and, and contributed in no way to her injury. Um, and that's important in the state of Georgia because uh, if you are more than 50% at fault, as a plaintiff, you cannot recover. Uh, so it, it's always important to show uh, that the client did not do anything to contribute to the injury. And, and we did that here um, with her friend who was with her immediately before she went down the slide. Um, so we got a second affidavit, and I think Jeb is going to go through that one with you. Yeah. So uh, we talked with another person who was on the boat and um, essentially elicited the same testimony we wanted to show. Uh, let's see, that he couldn't tell, this, is, this person couldn't tell either, whether the uh, engine was on when they went down the slide because the sound from the uh, generator sounded similar. And that's what paragraph, uh, looks like paragraph six, is about right here. You know, the, an engine can be on, uh, people who know boats probably know this, the engine can be on and the boat not moving because the motor can be on, but the um, the clutch is engaged or whatever, so the propeller doesn't spin. But 
if the if the boat is moving, then the propeller must be spinning, and if the boat is not moving, the propeller cannot be spinning, because if the propeller was spinning, it would move the boat either forward or backwards. So that's why it's important that these witnesses say, as both did, that the boat wasn't moving when our client went down the slide. Here in paragraph seven, this witness says says the same thing um, in different words. Says the boat was not being driven forward or backward by the propeller, i.e. the propeller was not turning at the time that our client, whose name was removed for privacy reasons, went down the slide. So that was putting together the facts. Um, putting together the facts is not all you have to do in a personal injury case. You also got to figure out the insurance picture. Here, uh, we were able to find three different insurance companies that provide coverage. Uh, one was See if I can highlight here. One was Hartford, um, and they had a policy that provided up to one million dollars worth of coverage. Although it was a specific type of policy, that more we'll talk about in a minute. We also learned about a policy of Atlantic Specialty Insurance Company, which we originally thought, based on some documents that the uh, previous lawyer had obtained, was a three million dollar policy. It turns out that Atlantic Specialty had made a side deal with Liberty Mutual, and each of them had taken responsibility for one and a half million dollars of that three million dollar policy. So essentially, we had an underlying policy of um, one million dollars and then two excess policies, each of 1.5 million dollars. When you make a demand against multiple insurers like that, you have to be really careful to do it correctly or um, they can undercut your claim in some sort of technical legal ways. Which is why you know we take so much care in our um, offer letters, you know, here and elsewhere, to be really precise about what's happening, what they have to do to accept the demand, um, who can accept it, and in what order they have to do it. It has to be in writing, unequivocal, without variance of any sort, and all sorts of other things. And you can see some of the effort we go to to get this right. And in the end, we did. Um, and that's why the case settled for $3.97 billion. But Morgan, 3.97 is an awfully strange number. Where does that come from? Yeah, so uh, as Jeb alluded to, this Hartford policy was a uh, special type policy. It, it was called uh, an eroding policy. So typically, when you're in a car accident uh, and you've got a $25,000 policy, uh, that covers one $25,000 worth of liability, but also your attorney's fees. Um, and those attorney's fees don't come out of that $25,000 worth of liability coverage. However, in an eroding policy, your attorney's fees do come out. Uh, so here, uh, some, some money had been spent um, defending this case and perhaps another claim. Uh, so we, we did not have the full $4 million, or, or here, $1 million of, of coverage total, $4 million uh, to, to get. So um, unfortunately, because the, the type of policy purchased by this uh, boat rental company was an eroding policy, we were not able to get uh, a full $4 million. Yeah, so basically, the, um, the total policy amount was $4 million. The insurance, the insurance defense lawyers ran up approximately um, $30,000, a little bit less than that, worth of bills on the case. And that got, it's taken out of the policy because it's eroding. And that leaves us with the, final, the remaining insurance limits of about uh, 3.97 million. So that's how we get to the 3.97 million dollar settlement amount. A lot of times I think uh, people hear about personal injury cases and there's an injury and then a big settlement and I think it happens just like that. It's a, a short, simple process. Um, it's kind of like a duck moving across a pond. You can see a duck go from one side to another and it seems to glide effortlessly. But if you look under the water, you can see there's a lot of hard paddling going on. So we hope we've been able to describe at least some of that hard paddling today. Thanks. Mm -hmm.